This is episode 80 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, you'll hear a special interview with the Magic Detective Dean Carnegie. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for magic history. I'm Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective and this is episode number 80. And well, to my surprise, I have received a number of glowing emails and phone calls about the previous episode on Charlie Miller. And I have to say, I'm a little surprised because when I did that podcast, I I did it while I was on the road and I didn't have access to all my reference materials. And I kind of felt like maybe this wasn't as good as it could have been, but as it turns out, it was a real winner among the listeners. So thank you very much. Um, It has taken me a little too long to get the next podcast done. I'm working on a podcast on Chingling Fu, and I'm about, I I seriously thought it would be done by now, but being a full-time performer and having to deal with all the administrative duties and all of that behind the scenes, it is just uh, eating up my time. So I don't have that podcast ready. That'll be podcast number 81. So instead, um, instead of leaving you hanging with nothing, I thought what I would do is give you um, something special. So a few years ago, I did a radio interview with John Michael Marty. He's from a radio station in mid-Illinois, WSMI-FM. And we talked about uh, Houdini, and we talked about Magic History, talked about me, we talked about my friend Steve Baker, the escape artist. So I thought you might enjoy listening to that particular interview. And, uh, and it just so happens that uh, we're going to be doing another interview closer to Halloween this year. Um, more on Houdini, I think. But uh, this one is from a couple years ago, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So here we go. I am uh, so tickled to death to have this guest. In this hour, his name is Dean Carnegie. Dean uh, and I met uh, for the first time back, oh, two or three years ago, uh, when we were talking about our mutual friend, Steve Baker. And the interesting thing about Dean Carnegie, he is not only a magician and an escape artist uh, on his own, but he is also a magic detective. Uh, He is a historian who has a lot of stuff to talk about today. And, uh, Dean, welcome to Mid-Illinois and WSMI-FM. Hey, thank you, John. I'm glad to be here and looking forward to it. Well, you know, one of the most fascinating things about magic is the mystery of it. And it's always fun to try and figure things out. People don't always do a very good job of it, and that's why, of course, it's so popular. Our good friend, Steve Baker, who was... I guess uh, the best thing to say, started at a very early age while he was confined to bed rest from, I believe, was it rheumatic fever or or something that he had early on? Yeah, that's correct, rheumatic fever, yep. So, uh, which was not uncommon at that time. And uh, Steve got a book on magic and, and started learning. And one of the first easiest things to learn, I guess, while you're bedridden is how to get your hands free from a from a rope. And that got him started on the uh, the escape part. Now, how on earth did your relationship with Steve Baker start out, and where can we go from there? Well, it's uh, it's funny. You know, I remember seeing Steve on TV back in the 1970s and 80s. Steve was on TV all the time doing his incredible escapes. And I was just a kid, and I would see this guy. And, and the funny thing about it is I would see him, and I'd be like, well, who is this guy who thinks he's Houdini? Yeah. So <laughs> right. I, did, I didn't really like him very much. You know, I just thought, you know, I don't know who he thinks he is. But And then years later, um, I'm working on a book on Houdini, and, I, and a friend of mine says, hey, why don't you contact Steve Baker? And I'm like, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> so – so I, I was able to get Steve's uh, information, and I called him on the phone. And for the first two or three minutes, you could tell a little bit of apprehension in his voice. He was very guarded at that time. 
with who he talked to. And uh, all of a sudden, things turned, and we just started talking and talking. And next thing I know, three hours had gone by. We hadn't even got to Houdini. And he said, well, call me tomorrow. And this, this started a friendship where we talked almost every day on the phone for at least an hour uh, about magic, escapes, eventually Houdini. And uh, that's, that's where it all came about. So there's, and we're going to get back to that. That was the combi- That was the connection with Steve. Now, how did you how did you decide that you wanted to delve deep into the history of the mystery of magic? How did that come about? Well, when I was when I started out in magic, um, we lived in uh, lived at a subdivision in, in uh, uh, Northern Virginia. And had, you know, neighbors and friends and everything. And then just as I was getting into magic, we moved out to the country where I had no friends, didn't know anybody. There was no neighbors around or anything like that. So magic became this thing that I spent all my time doing. And because there's, because there were no, no other magicians around, I started reading books on magic. And the only ones I could find were magic history books. So I started to learn all this history about about magicians, and it, be, it became ingrained in me. And then over time, it just I continued to do that, continued to research magicians, until I found out there's this whole community of people that are uh, interested in the history of magic and collecting magic and that kind of thing. So that's where it started for me. And then about 10 years ago, I started a blog called themagicdetective.com where I just started writing stories about famous magicians and not so famous magicians and and uh, and it really it's, it's had over i think it's had close to two million views so it's, it's very popular it's amazing when we see magicians depicted in the movies or on certain tv shows there is a great deal of showmanship that that they're able to do but there's always a little bit of sinister or uh not quite above board. They don't really give magicians on TV a a very nice picture, and yet in reality, uh, that's not that's not always the case. Yeah, well, I think that comes from you know, magic has this this uh, image, I guess, uh, kind of uh, seems kind of nefarious. You, you, when you ask somebody. You know, name a magician, or, or not just name a magician, but draw a magician. They might draw somebody with a with a top hat and a, a long mustache and a cape. And that image that they're describing, they don't even realize it, but that image is of a magician that lived a hundred years ago, named Alexander Herman, who had a very uh, they used to call him a, a Mephistophelian uh, image, almost like a devilish uh, image to him. And and for whatever reason, over time, that image has carried on. So when people depict magicians, they always seem to depict them uh, in that kind of scary mode or the opposite side is a very goofy, silly mode. And uh, magicians aren't really either of those. They're somewhere in the middle. <laughs> yes. Your, uh, your blog, The Magic Detective, uh, you say nearly two million views. How does uh, one find that? Is it still active? Yeah, the uh, the magicdetective dot com is still active. Although what I've done recently uh, is actually started to change the blog into a podcast that you can actually listen to on your mobile devices and that kind of thing. And that's actually magicdetectivepodcast dot com. And what I've done basically, it's like. You know, if you listen to a podcast, it's basically like listening to the radio on your mobile devices. And I've taken a lot of these stories from my my blog because there are over 700 stories. I've taken a lot of them and just uh, uh, I write a script for it and and, uh, talk about these these like I said, famous and infamous and not so famous uh, performers over the last hundred years. And both of those things are still active: the podcast and the blog. Oh, that's wonderful. And to find the blog so you can read if you want to, how does one get there? The the, uh, the address for the blog is themagicdetective.com. Okay. All right. Well, that that is awesome. So now you've got two different ways that you can read 700 of these things and hear a bunch of the stories on the podcast. Now, again, going back to – and by the way, our guest is Dean Carnegie, the magic detective, calling me from 
Northern Virginia right now. I, although I believe you said you were going to be moving to Nashville. Is that correct? That's true. I'm going to be moving to Nashville uh, in the fall once I finish my uh, summer tour. I have, I'm in the midst of 100 shows right now. So once I get that out of the way, uh, I'll be uh, packing everything up and moving um, all my operation over to Nashville. When uh, you first met Steve and you had that first three-hour conversation, which led to more talk and more talk, uh, Steve has done so many hours on television. I believe more hours on live television than anybody, any other magician or escape artist. And he has Dick Clark, I'm sure to thank for that. The HBO special that he did with Tony Curtis, that's been 35 or 40 years ago, I guess. But yeah. the the interesting thing, when people watch some of those back, if they happen to get a hold of the DVD or watch some things on YouTube, it, it's fascinating to see how close they cut you know how 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 close to the end before he runs out of time this happens but steve was so good at doing that except for one time Uh, because i remember and i think you can probably tell the story he told me about the the uh, pyramid in venezuela where they used gasoline instead of kerosene oh yeah yeah so yeah that was uh Caracas, Venezuela, and Steve had been uh, contacted to come there and do a couple of escapes. And he was there. Uh, the amazing Randy was there also. And both of them were there to uh, to do for different escapes. And Randy had been hired to hang upside down from a helicopter and escape from a straitjacket. And Steve watched this, and he said, you know, they, they look like they're trying to kill this man. Oh. And... Um, so he was like, you know, we need to be very careful what we're doing. And his, his escape that Steve was going to do was called Trial by Fire. And basically there was this post that he would be uh, chained to, and then this sort of teepee-like structure would go around it, and they were supposed to douse it with a, uh, a liquid that Steve had created. So it was a specially controlled sort of liquid that when you set it on fire, you know, gave a very controlled fire. Well... Steve's uh, initial thought was correct, where they were probably trying to kill him, because instead of using his concoction, they used gasoline, and they covered this thing, and there's there's video footage of it, you can see the, the gasoline seeping into, uh, underneath the teepee, so it's in there with where Steve is as well, and the moment they left this thing on fire, it was like a bomb going off, it's oh. just this huge explosion, the teepee just blew apart, and the, the whole screen goes white for a moment. And then all of a sudden you, 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 you sort of see Steve, and he's, he's getting up, and uh, his hair is singed. His hair was completely burned. Uh, he ended up with second-degree burns. And I talked to him about it, and, and uh, he, said, he said, I had trouble getting out of the uh, – out of the chain, and he said, but all of a sudden, I, he said, I smelt this gasoline. He said, I ripped the chains out of the post and jumped out of this thing just as it was exploding. He said, if he hadn't done that, he, he may not have uh, survived it. No. You know, it's, it's so difficult to imagine putting your life in the hands of others, especially if, if their, their intentions are not so good. I yeah. I remember seeing the video where he was in Japan and the roller coaster, uh, which I understand that the test was a little different condition than the actual event. Oh yeah, the the Japanese roller coaster. Well, that began. Uh, he was originally contacted to do an escape from the the Japanese bullet train. And they flew over there, and as soon as he got over, uh, by the time he got over, I should say, the uh, the Japanese government had got involved, and they they wouldn't let him do the escape from the bullet train because they said if it, you know if a chain or a handcuff or something were still on the train as it as it came by, it could derail it. It would be a national emergency, so they were, they wouldn't let him do that. So they said, okay, well we'll do an escape from a roller coaster instead. So. He goes to do the escape, and it's freezing cold. And normally Steve wouldn't do escapes when it was cold like this, so he asked them to run the roller coaster a couple times so they could time it because he needed to know just how long 
it would take from, you know, when it started to where it would pass where he was supposed to be chained. And he timed it, and it was like a minute 30. And they said, run it again, and they ran it again. And it was, now it was like a minute 20. And he noticed because the tracks were warming up, the more you ran it by, the, uh, the faster it got. So they finally got to a point where, okay, it's going to be like a minute 10, so I need to get out in like a minute 5. This is Steve's thinking. But when they put the, uh, the chains on him, they like stuck to his wrist. So they, he had to come up with something to figure out, you know, how can I get this so they don't just stick to me? I've got to be able to get them off. So they had come up with something that they called the, the Montequilla solution. This is what they called it. And uh, they broke for lunch before they did this escape, and they were able to get the thing they needed. And uh, when they came back from lunch, they were uh, the film crew was ready. They chained Steve to the, the track. They got the, 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 uh, the chains and everything on him. They gave him the signal that the coaster was starting. Steve began his escape, and he's timing it out in his mind. He gets one handcuff off, the other handcuff off, one of the ankle restraints off, and he, he's, he's getting ready to get the last one off, and he's looking, and he's like, where's, where's the, the roller coaster? It's, it should have be here by now. It should be five, sec- five seconds away, and there's no roller coaster Finally, he takes the the, uh, the the ankle restraint off. He stands up and he's like, "What is going on?" He jumps <laughs> off the track, and and like thirty seconds later, the the, the uh, roller coaster goes by, and he is livid. And uh, come to find out, what had happened was the operator of the roller coaster had seen what was going to happen, and he feared for Steve's life, so they he purposely slowed the roller coaster down. Oh my. <laughs> And so Steve was just livid, and the the Japanese uh, production company was like, "Don't worry, we'll fix it in the editing." And Steve was like, "You will not fix it in the editing. We will do it again. Nobody edits my escape." <laughs> so uh, so they go and they do it again, this time at the regular speed, and everything works out. And Steve gets out just at the nick of time, and he he turns to the crew and he said, "Hey, do you know how I did that?" And his crew all goes, "Montekia." And uh, and they all laughed. Well, what they didn't realize was Montequilla in Spanish was butter. So Steve Steve had slathered butter all over his wrists in order to get out of this stuff. So it was quite ironic. <laughs> Our guest is Dean Carnegie, the Magic Detective. You can hear his podcast at magicdetectivepodcast.com. You can read over 700 magic history and magic biographies at magicdetective.com. That's his blog. Uh, the, the opportunity to work with, with uh, Steve has been wonderful, but i got to believe also that just the joy of researching Houdini and, and Robert Houdin, uh, Houdin and all those other magicians, that's got to have been a labor of love for you. What, what about Houdini that maybe we don't know that you could pass on? Oh, my goodness. There are so many things. Uh, Houdini was such a fascinating character. And it, what's interesting to me, one of the things, I mean, there's so many things, but one is this man had, he must have carried a, a camera with him everywhere he went. Uh, and there are a hundred thousands of photographs that we know of, of Houdini. And here, over a hundred years after the man has passed away, every few months, new photos of this man turn up. It's wow. the craziest thing I've ever seen. And, of course, the, the you know, the folks like myself, the, Ma- the Houdini people, just go nuts whenever we see a new picture of Houdini. But uh, one of my favorite things was uh, happened here where I live, near Washington, D.C., 1926. Uh, Houdini was requested to testify before Congress because there was a, a bill that was going before Congress it was, it was called an anti-fortune-telling bill, but it was, it was kind of disguised in a way because Houdini was fighting the spiritualists at the time. Uh, of People course. Claimed they, yeah, they claimed they could talk to the dead. And they couldn't write a bill that banned spiritualism because that fell under, their, under you know, religion. Mm-hmm. So they figured out, okay, well, we'll write this anti-fortune-telling bill, and we'll write it so broadly that it will cover the spiritualists, and we'll put them out of business. So they bring Houdini in to de- testify. And what's funny is I- I've read the congressional transcript, and uh, 
what, what, what I find so ironic, Houdini is the most famous magician, most famous entertainer in the world at the time, and these congressmen, many of them, had no idea who, who Houdini was, which is just <laughs> so funny to me. Oh, and, I would say. But, but he, uh, he testifies, he talks to them, he demonstrates some of their stunts, and, and it's crazy. Here is Houdini, the you know, famous entertainer, and here he is standing before Congress, uh, you know, talking about a bill. I just find that so fascinating. It's ironic that we talk about Harry Houdini today, and I have you on the show, because on this day in 1923, he freed himself from a straight jacket while upside down, 40 feet above the ground in New York City. Yeah. And then I remember when Steve said Mr. Escape was born, when he did it from much higher up outside the uh, Tribune building in Oakland, California. Yeah, that was uh, February of uh, 1967. And uh, funny thing about that, Steve uh, Steve Baker was not known as Mr. Escape back then. He was <laughs> his uh, performing name was the Great Gerhardt. <laughs> I remember that. Yes. Yeah, and uh, so he had been he had been hired to do a fundraiser for uh, I, I forget if it was a school or a church. And uh, so they had this all set up, and he said, hey, let's promote it by doing uh, doing an escape. And he had found out that Houdini had done this escape from the Tribune Tower building like 40 years before. So they were able to work it out where he could do this same thing, hanging upside down in a straitjacket escape from the Tribune Tower building. He was going to do it a few floors higher than Houdini, and he had planned to do it faster than Houdini. I don't think he had any idea how this was going to turn out, because I, I believe it was something like 20,000 people came to see this. And you would never get that kind of turnout today for, a, you know, a live event on the street. But back then, it was just an enormous amount of people. And I've seen the photos, and it's just a sea of people everywhere. And uh, and sure enough, they, they hung Steve Baker upside down, and, um, and he got out in record time. And we, this is one escape that he and I would argue about because I told him, and uh, I, you know, it was my opinion, but I said I think you got out too fast, <laughs> and because he got out in like six or seven seconds or something like that, and and he would always say uh, 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 later he would say, you know, these these magicians they get out of these uh, straight jackets too fast, and then when I would bring up his, he he would argue with me and say, oh that doesn't that's not the same. So, <laughs> but I think what's funny is I think I was the only person that could argue with him about this stuff because I knew when, you know, when he was being full of it and he knew I knew and we got along, but other people that would bring that kind of stuff up, they would get in arguments and, and never speak again. So I was like one of the few that uh, had this kind of relationship with him. Oh, that's, uh, and, and Steve was a great guy. If you got a chance to, to get to know him a little bit and could share a beer with him or a cup of coffee. He he loved to tell stories, and not only just on him, he loved to tell a great joke, and he was a great joke teller, one thing I know for sure. Uh, you also said, again, back in your history and your, uh, and your research, uh, of course, Houdini didn't die in the water torture. He uh, died because of a sucker punch, I guess. What was the story there? Well, yeah, um, because of the uh, the movie that came out in the 50s on, by Tony Curtis, the Houdini movie, um, in that movie, Tony Curtis as Houdini dies in the water torture cell at the end of the movie. And that movie was so popular that the whole culture thought that Houdini actually died in the water torture cell. And the truth was, uh, he would do it every day of the week, uh, and twice on Sunday. I mean, it was one. You know, it was his signature thing, and he did it all the time. And uh, towards the end of his career, it was 1926. He was uh, he was in Montreal, Canada, and they were uh, you know up there doing the show. And Houdini was meeting with a couple students before the show, and one of the students, his name was Gordon Whitehead, was talking to Houdini, and he said, he said, I've heard that you claim to have this iron midriff, this iron stomach that you could take a punch from somebody and you would not feel it. And Houdini was kind of looking through his mail at the time, and he'd be, yeah, yeah, I can do that, yeah. 
And, uh, and the student was like gung ho on this. So he said, you know, Mr. Houdini, do you mind if I try? And Houdini's like, yeah, sure. And again, he's sort of paying attention, sort of not paying attention. And he goes to stand up to, uh, you know, to demonstrate this to the, to the young man. And all of a sudden this fellow punches Houdini, boom, 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 as hard as he can. Houdini had not prepared himself for the blows. And apparently this caused, um, what would eventually be a ruptured appendix. And the ruptured appendix would eventually turn to a peritonitis, where the it turns like gangrene, I guess, and there's a poison that goes throughout your body. And back then, they didn't have antibiotics, so there was there was nothing they could do for him, and that's what eventually killed Houdini. Was that? Were Houdini and Tesla, uh, by any chance, friends as well as contemporaries? Uh, not that I'm aware of. There, I have seen a photo of a fellow that I swear is Tesla, but uh, I've been told it's not uh, Tesla and Houdini. Uh, but I've been told it's not. Uh, he was, he knew Edison, but I don't believe he had any connection to Tesla. At least not that I've been able to find. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your shows. I ask you about crazy things happening. What's the craziest thing that ever happened during one of your shows? Uh, well, that's, that's pretty wild. Um, well, one of my favorite stories, this happened years ago. Uh, I, I had been uh, hired along with uh, several other performers to do a fundraising show for a fire department. And they had it at a theater, and there were, I think there were three or four of us in the show. So we each had a segment to do in the program. And it, it came time for me to do my segment, and I was going to float a girl on the tip of a fluorescent light bulb. A light bulb would be uh, sitting upright, and the girl would, would place her arm on the edge of this bulb, and she would float up. And it's a beautiful effect. And so the music begins, and the light is on, and the girl puts her arm on here. And I hear something from the audience. And it's like it's not a response that I'm used to. I'm used to, you know, oh, wow, that kind of thing. And uh, this is more of a shrieking sound from the audience. And I happen to look down, and the light bulb is on fire. <laughs> and here I am doing a fundraiser for a fire department. <laughs> and my prop catches on fire during the show. So I'm like, uh, you know, everything runs through my mind. Finally, I'm like, you know, pull, you know, just I told them pull the curtain. They closed the curtain and pulled the plug, and the fire went out. And later, we found out what happened. The the prop had what's called gaffer's tape around the the upper and lower part of the, the fluorescent bulb, and it should have been electrical tape. But whoever had it before me put gaffer's tape, and this. You know, gaffer's tape will catch fire, and that's what happened. So we fixed it before the next show, but uh, wisely the producer of the show said, I don't think it's a good idea for you to do the the, uh, the light bulb thing. And that's okay. I had other stuff. So that was uh, one of the crazier things that ever happened to me. <laughs> My goodness. Um, MagicDetectivePodcast.com. You can hear Dean tell these stories. It won't take as long. You, there, uh, probably most of your podcasts are five or ten minutes long. I actually know the uh, the podcasts run. The sh there are short podcasts that are about fifteen minutes. There's only three of those. The others run anywhere from thirty to almost an hour. So okay, so you do you do really delve into it. That's great. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about the history. Magic's been around since people have been around. Obviously, somebody figured something out, how to wow somebody or to gain control over someone by making them so enamored by what you could do. What are some, who are some of the people that have led this particular art form to where it is today? Well, magic, magic's been around for hundreds of years, mostly for, you know, for the longest time magic was, was a, kind of a street performer kind of thing, because this is before they had theaters and stuff. So you'd find a magician at a fair or a festival, and, you know, and they would do a lot of tricks that you see today, like the cups and balls and card tricks and tricks with eggs and coins. And this was popular for hundreds of years 
until around the, the 19th century. In the 19th century, you have several performers, but probably the most prominent of them was Robert Houdin from France, who decided, you know what, this, I, 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 he got interested by seeing a street performer, and he thought, well, what would happen if we brought this indoors into a theater? So he created his own theater and started to do shows inside, and it became very popular among the, the very wealthy people of Paris. To, to see his shows, and it just so happens the same thing that took place with his show started in other parts of Europe. Uh, in Austria, there was a performer and, and other areas. So magic went from being outside to going inside into theaters. And then when you get to the latter part of the, uh, the 1800s is where you start getting folks like Houdini and Alexander Herman and Harry Keller and these folks who – Harry Keller, by the way – uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone in your audience has heard of The Wizard of Oz. Sure. Well, well, Harry Keller was the most famous magician in America around 1900. He was also the inspiration for the character of The Wizard of Oz when L. Frank Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz. Oh. Pretty fascinating little trivia there. But... Um, yeah, magic, it moved from outside to inside into the theaters and eventually to, you know, to television. And then uh, I guess in the 1990s, uh, thanks to David Blaine, it went from being uh, in, you know, in the theaters back onto the streets. And David Blaine made it popular, made street magic popular. So nowadays, when you see magic on TV, there's often a combination of seeing it done on the streets and, and inside and, and lots of different, you know, um, venues. So when you go to Las Vegas and you go to Branson and you see theaters or rooms in the casinos dedicated to magic, it has come a long, long ways from where it was. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, <clears throat> there are quite, quite a few performers. Of course, David Copperfield, the most famous magician of our generation, is, is performing in Las Vegas right now and uh, has a fabulous show from what I understand. I've not seen him since. He toured, and I think he stopped touring sometime in the, the late 90s. But uh, he's a, a resident there, has his own theater there at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Uh, of course, before uh, Copperfield was ever around, you had Siegfried and Roy and Lance Burton and those kind of characters. But, yeah, Magic, uh, magic is still alive and, and pop, more popular than ever. Now, and speaking of that, now you mentioned you've got a 100-show tour the rest of this summer before you move to Nashville and start all over again, uh, what's, what, do you, what do you attribute to this popularity? Uh, well, to be honest, I think a lot of the – you've got YouTube uh, on the Internet. You have uh, shows like America's Got Talent. There's a show that's on the WB called Penn and Teller Fool Us uh, where – it's a platform for magicians to be seen nationally. And so you have magicians on America's Got Talent. You have magicians on this Fool Us show. Uh, every country has their own version of a Got Talent show. And these Got Talent shows are for variety performers. Well, king among the variety performers are magicians. Of course. Yeah. So, so the magicians tend to excel. Um, they've had in Australia, they've had a number of magicians win the Australia's Got Talent. Same thing in Britain. Britain's Got Talent has featured and had some just incredible uh, performers win. And, of course, people see this now on, you know, they see the clips on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And there's, and there's even, there's even um, internet celebrity magicians. And that's all they do is do, they shoot a clip in front of people on the street, and then they upload that on, online. And you see incredible close-up magic done uh, there on Instagram and Facebook and what have you. And, yeah, so it, every new technology seems to – magicians just embrace it and they run with it, and it's added to the, uh, the popularity of magic today. And the escape artists, uh, an offshoot of, of magic, but yet certainly its own art form, uh, do you – in your shows, do you do a combination of both, Dean? Yeah, I do. Um, there are times when I don't, like this summer, I don't have any escapes in the show, but uh, often I will have um, several escapes. 
sometimes they're they're very sim- you know nothing dangerous uh, unless it's a, a big uh, a big event. I um, I kind of go along with what Steve often said. If you do these dangerous things too often, people think, well, how dangerous can they be? <laughs> so. True. Um, you know, I, I leave that. Uh, I actually leave that to some of the younger guys. You guys go ahead and put your life on the line. I'm going to do uh, some things that are that are very uh, intense, but maybe not so uh, uh, life threatening. I uh, to go back and talk about uh, Steve just a moment or two. The one of the enjoyable things is to search on YouTube or perhaps get a hold of the DVD of Steve's Greatest Escapes. Uh, all of the Dick Clark Live Wednesdays, the games people play, all of those different shows that he did on television with a different escape every week were fascinating to watch, whether it was a car careening down in front of, the, in front of you in, a, in the coffin of death or doing the water torture cell as he did so many times. Week after week, he'd come up with something new, and they were always scary as heck you know oh yeah yeah steve um you know most escape artists kind of follow the houdini trend and they do material that houdini had done steve did that when he started he duplicated a lot of houdini stunts and he sort of stopped with houdini's water torture he kept doing the water torture but he always wanted to do it differently than houdini did so every time he appeared on tv he had a slightly different twist to how he presented it. But then he started to come up with these other grand escapes, like like you said, like the Coffin of Death, um, uh, Trial by Fire, which he did successfully uh, a number of times, but except for that one time in, in Venezuela. Right. But, uh, yeah, he, he sort of he changed the way uh, we thought of escapes because he started adding new escapes instead of just duplicating what had been done before. You said that you are having your tour uh, this summer around the east there, but then you're moving to Nashville. Hopefully, Dean, you'll have a chance to uh, get up our direction and sometime close enough that we can have you back again or maybe in the studio and we can promote one of your shows up in the Midwest. Oh, yeah, I would love to do that anytime, sure. Uh, where our guest is Dean Carnegie. The podcast is magicdetectivepodcast.com. The blog is magicdetectivetodd.com. There are so many stories about the history of magic, about different things regarding magic, that it would be a pretty good thing and I think pretty interesting to check out if you have that desire. If, you, if you're 12 and you want to start swallowing steak knives, you'd better uh, talk to mom and dad first. <laughs> I As agree. You, you know. I mean, I got to believe that could be an issue with some young impressionable child. They just got to tell them, don't start with knives, I would imagine. Yeah, and and it's funny, uh, Steve, whenever Steve was on TV and did any sort of dangerous thing, he always prefaced it by saying, don't try this kind of thing at home, which I always respected him for, for saying that. Nowadays, you don't really see people saying that. They just go into it. But Steve always made a point because he knew there, you know, he was one of them. He was one of the impressionable kids that decided to do these crazy things. Uh, so he was trying to, you know, kind of squelch that a little bit and prevent anything bad from happening. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule to uh, spend this time with us. Before I let you go, I. Is there anything that you would like to add or anything we haven't covered that you'd like to make sure we talk about today? Uh, the only other thing, uh, you mentioned my, my blog and my podcast. Thanks for doing that. Uh, if you want to check out me personally, you can go on uh, CarnegieMagic.com, and uh, there are uh, videos there on the site of, of my performances and things. So if you want to check me out, I'm, I'm available to hire. I don't just perform in uh, northern Virginia, but I perform all over the country. So if anyone out there is looking for uh, an incredible show, uh, please go to CarnegieMagic.com and see if uh, I'm what you're looking for. Do you? Would you explain, before I let you go, one more question popped into my head. Tell me what your steampunk magic show was like. The, I saw some of the props and I saw the costumes, and they were absolutely intriguing. What exactly is steampunk magic? Oh, well, um, steampunk is a, um, 
how do I put it? It's sort of a, a reimagining of history. So uh, it, it started in, a, it was originally a literary movement, and there were all these books that were written that sort of uh, reimagined Victorian history, like um, a lot of the Jules Verne books and that kind of thing, 20,000 Leagues Under sure. the Sea, H.G. Wells. And if you remember, like, uh, the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea that Disney did, and you see this really interesting architecture and design that uh, was in that movie. Well, back in the 80s, some people said, you know, this is really cool. Let's, let's take this further. And somewhere along the, the way, it got the term steampunk. And so a few years ago, I think mean, maybe 10 years ago now, um, I was like, hey, I like this steampunk stuff. I like the way they dress, very Victorian, but yet it's got an edge to it. What if I applied that to magic? So I started to redesign a lot of my props. And when I say redesign, basically just changed the, the outer look, not the you know inner workings, but the outer look. And what I found was is all these props that, a lot of people, a lot of magicians had discounted, you know, oh, we're not going to do this anymore. This is old, old material. No one's interested in this. Because it had the steampunk look, all of a sudden audiences were totally intrigued by it. So uh, so I created a whole show around this whole steampunk genre. That's amazing. Uh, if someone uh, would like to hear this, uh, let you know that this will be up as a podcast on our station website as well, and uh, so people can hear this anytime they'd like if they missed it today. And I will also make sure you get a copy of it yourself, okay? Oh, fantastic. I appreciate that. Dean, thank you so much for being our guest today. It was fascinating, enjoyable, enlightening, and I hope that uh, in a few months or in a, within a year or so, we'll come back and catch up again, okay? That would be great. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you, Dean. Dean Carnegie. Magic Detective, magicdetective.com or magicdetectivepodcast.com. And that was my interview with John Michael Marty of WSMI-FM Radio in Mid-Illinois. This, again, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but he actually gave the wrong, uh, the wrong e um, website address for my uh, blog, which is it's actually themagicdetective.com themagicdetective.com is to the blog and magicdetectivepodcast.com is the podcast which you're listening to right now. I hope you enjoyed the interview and I will be back hopefully very soon, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully with the Chingling Fu episode. So until then, please be safe. Please take care of yourselves. I'm Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Until next time.